Stephen, thank you very much for the introduction. The way this is going to work is that I'm going to do the first half, and I'm Dave, not Ann. I'm going to do the first half, and then I'm going to turn it over to my co-author and wife for the second half of the talk. And what we're going to talk to you about today is essentially why healthy fertile soil is important to people from scales ranging to maintaining agricultural civilizations over the long run. And I'm a geologist, so that's kind of my world of, of expertise. And we're going to connect it also to our, each of our individual health in terms of what goes on in our gut and how our food is grown. So we're going to go from the broad down to within each one of us. And that second part is more Anne's area of expertise. So I'll turn the floor over to her for the second, for the second part. And can we turn the monitors on, please? Um, and what we're going to do is essentially talk about the, um, a series of three books that we wrote. It's what we lovingly call our Dirt Trilogy. Um, the first one I started about 10 years ago. It's a book you might expect a geologist to write about soils. It looks backwards through history and looks at what happened to societies around the world that did not take care of their soil over the long run. And so if the first part of this talk is a little bit depressing, don't worry, it's going to get a lot better by the end. That middle book, the one that Ann and I wrote together, The Hidden Half of Nature, that's our exploration of the science behind why microbial life, that the bacteria and fungi in the soil and in our gut are actually key components supporting the health and fertility of soils and also our own health and our immune systems. The third book, Growing a Revolution, takes the lessons from that first book, the science from the second book, and applies it to the problem of how we could restore soils to farming and farms around the world. It's sort of an exploration of how to translate what Ann will be telling you about into a larger scale. So, and if you if you're, uh, want to live tweet or Twitter handles on up there, feel free to connect with us at any time. But let me give the bottom line right out of the gate. What's good for the earth, it turns out, is good for us. You know, that shouldn't be a big mystery, but if we actually took that to heart, we would change an awful lot of practices in both agriculture and medicine. That's sort of the underlying theme and message, and um, that's where I will get to. But let me start with why a geologist today would be fairly concerned about the state of the world's soils. This map shows you the UN's global map of soil degradation. You'll notice there's an awful lot of orange and yellow on that map. Those are areas of degraded and very degraded agricultural soils. What does that mean? Well, very degraded agricultural soils are soils for which the loss of either the soil or the degradation of its fertility has impacted its ability to grow food for us. Now, I like to use this map to start talks like this because it does two things. One, it puts into perspective that soil degradation is a global problem. The other thing it allows me to do is to say, well, not so fast. You can look within every one of those red zones on the map, and you can find farms that are actually rebuilding fertile soil at a pace that a geologist finds astounding. That's where the good news lies. So we'll get there, but first let's go through and look at the most recent assessment of the state of the world's soils. There was a report that came out in 2015, the UN's Global State of the Soil Assessment, that argued that humanity, the collective us at a global scale, is losing 0.3% of our agricultural production capacity each and every year to ongoing soil loss and soil degradation. 0.3%, that's kind of a small number. It's kind of what we're all getting on our savings accounts these days, I think. But at least it's a positive number, so it's not like our 401ks. Okay, that's not funny, I know. Um, the point, though, is that over the next century, we're on track to degrade another third of the world's farmland. Because that 0.3%, if you multiply it out by 100 years, it's 30%. We've already degraded a third of the world's farm and cropland. We're on track to degrade another third over this century. It's my contention that agriculture is going to have to change in the 21st century because we simply can't go on raising our food in a way that will compromise the ability of future generations to keep doing so. Our population is projected to rise during this century, not go further down. We can't afford to continue degrading farmland around the world. Fortunately, there's a way to avoid that. But that's not what I wrote about in the Dirt Book. The Dirt Book is the backwards-looking book that looks at the history of civilizations. Um, and I thought it would be an, interesting to explore the history of erosion because it would be a good excuse to go visit ruins around the world and indulge some of my interest in geology. And I'm that kind of geologist 
who studies how soil erosion works naturally, how mountains are shaped, how rivers work. But in traveling around the world and viewing and working on most of the continents, I started to notice correlations that societies that had degraded their land remained impoverished centuries after their, their ancestors had done so. And I started to put the dirt book together. What I realized in studying the history of, science, of societies around the world was that soil erosion and degradation played a role in the undermining of civilizations that ranged from Mesopotamia, some of the earliest roots of, of um, agriculture in the West, to classical Greece, Rome, the southern United States, Easter Island, China, there's lots that you could actually uh, go, go through, and I do that in the dirt book. Um, but the, um, the commonality that you find in environmental history textbooks, because the idea that soil degradation, that land degradation, impacted human societies is not a new idea. I'm not claiming credit for that as a new idea. It's been written about for a long time, actually. It hasn't been acted on a whole lot, but the story that you find in different societies around the world is actually surprisingly similar. You find the stories of um, degradation that impacted societies. The culprit that you usually find in environmental history textbooks, though, is that deforestation led to soil loss that undermined societies. And I realized in researching this book that that actually, that actually wasn't correct. It wasn't the ax, but it was the plow that followed that set soil degradation on course to actually impact whole regions around the world. So what is it about the plow that actually led to soil degradation? Well, the invention of the plow fundamentally altered the balance of soil erosion and soil production at the surface of the earth. And if you think about the soil the way a geologist thinks about soil, as, a, as something that can be made, as something that can be lost, how do you make soil? It's from the combination of the mineral matter and rocks, the kind of geology that I work on, and biology, the kind of stuff that Anne works on. It's that combination of geology and biology, of mineral matter and organic matter and, and plants and the microbes in the soil that make healthy, living, fertile, productive soil. What does a plow do to that? Well, a plow is intended to turn the soil upside down. It's exceptionally good weed control. We all kind of know this, and that's one of the reasons it was very uh, widely adopted in agriculture for centuries. But what it also does is it leaves the soil bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain for some part of the year, until the next, either weeds come in or the next crop comes in. And if you get a good storm at a time when the land is bare, you can erode off an awful lot of soil. And if you think about soil as that system, much like your bank account, we all have income and we have expenses. And in the soil, our income is building soil from mixing rocks and, and organic matter. Our expenses are soil erosion. And the standing crop of soil on a landscape, you can think of as the natural capital that finances agricultural civilizations. And in the same way that if we spend more money faster than we make money, we're depleting our savings. And I know this as, an, as a, for sure, that if you spend money faster than you make it for long enough, you can completely burn through your savings, because I've done it a few times. Soil is no different at a societal level. Now this slide of um, the Palouse region in eastern Washington it's sort of a hilly country that has beautiful agricultural soils, um, but this slide of a winter wheat field illustrates why a geologist like myself would look at plow-based agriculture and see it as a slow motion disaster. Because look at all those little channels that are cut into that hillside. We call those rills. You could erase them with a single pass of the plow. But notice there's no plants on that wheat field. This is a kind of a system that was a wheat fallow rotation. So you'd grow wheat, then you'd let it, you'd plow it up, and you'd let it sit bare for a season. If you got rain when it wasn't covered with plants, you'd get erosion like this. It's an agronomic nuisance. With a plow, you can basically erase all those little channels, but they add up over time. How big a, a, an effect can it make over time? Well, this next slide is also from the Palouse region. And I like to talk about the Palouse because I'm from Washington State. Anne and I live in Seattle, as she'll be going into a little bit more later. And I find it's generally safer to pick on your own home state when you travel. But the Palouse is an area, it's very rich agricultural land. When this, when this field was, was first plowed back in um, 1911, this fence up there is a fence that encircles the farmer's water supply, a water cistern. And you know, it's not good to plow over your own water supply. So they built a fence around it, and nothing's happened on this field for the next 50 years, because the photograph was taken in 1961. Uh, nothing's happened other than it was that wheat fallow rotation, 
And some years the rain would come when the land was bare, those little rills would be uh, carved into the landscape. And if you plow in the same direction every year on a sloping hill, you're moving soil downhill progressively. So what happened is you created this cliff over the course of 50 years. And how high is that cliff? That's about a five foot high cliff. Think about that for a minute. Five feet of soil loss in 50 years. That's about a foot every decade. That's about an inch a year. There's nowhere on earth that soil forms at that pace, except my wife's garden and some farms that I visited. But nature doesn't build soil that fast. The good news when we get a little later is that we can do it, and we can do it in ways that can actually help and benefit our own health. Um, but I also hope you're sitting there going, isn't that a pretty extreme example? And of course it is, that's why I use it. It's the most extreme example I could find. You should be sitting there going, how typical is it? How does this paint across a whole landscape? How, what, what's the number globally, for example? Well, let me, I'm not gonna walk you through every civilization that I talked about in the dirt book, because I'd be here talking till midnight, and then I'd be up, you know, getting in trouble for burning ants half of the talk up. But this shows you the magnitude of historical soil erosion, soil erosion in the Piedmont region, the hill country from Virginia down there to Alabama on the southeastern seaboard of the United States, an area that was one of the bread baskets of the early uh, colonies, and uh, early European colonies in North America. And you'll notice that gray corresponds to four to 10 inches of soil loss over the last two to 300 years. Now, how big a deal is that? Well, if you go back and you read the journals of some of the original farmers and plantation owners that, worked, that first worked this land for agriculture, uh, for Western agriculture, that is, um, there was only about six to 12 inches of rich black earth over the subsoil. The fertility of the land is held in the topsoil, not the subsoil. One of the problems with erosion is if you shave it off the top, you're losing the best stuff first. So if we could erode off a third to virtually all of the topsoil across a region that was one of the breadbaskets of the early American colonies, and we could do it in just a few hundred years. Think what the Greeks could have done a thousand year run at, at southern Greece. Think what the Romans could have done with an 800 year run at central Italy, with much the same technology of plow-based agriculture. Has anyone ever in here ever been to the, the ancient port of Rome, Ostia? How, it, can you see the ocean from there? It's inland. It's miles inland. You don't build harbors inland. What happened is the soils of central Italy washed off, pushed the coast out, formed the famous Pontine Marshes. Um, the example from the southern United States illustrates that the idea that soil loss can impact societies in ways that can undercut their future viability, um, it makes, and that they did this in regions around the world, not sound like the crazy, crazy ravings from a, of a professor from Seattle. It actually pencils out, um, and it is a very important problem. What we've done, well this shows you the soil, in that gray noodle in a part of North Carolina that I went to and visited as part of an episode of the TV program Nova, and the monitors just died again, um, uh, the, the TV program Nova, um, where they're trying to illustrate the, mag the history of soil in the United States. And what I like about this photograph is it basically shows in a nutshell what we've done with agriculture over the last few centuries. The soil on the left, hopefully you can see that it's darker than the soil on the right, uh, this stuff on the right is from a conventional tobacco plantation that's had about 100 years of um, agrochemical inten agrochemically intensive agriculture, and it looks like khaki beach sand. And it looks that way for a very good reason. You can basically pick this similar kind of stuff up on the California beach, right out of the sea. There's no organic matter in it. There's hardly any life in it. Um, it's, and it looks like beach sand because it is beach sand. It's 10 million year old beach sand. What it's lacking, is not the geology for fertile soil, it's lacking the biology, it's lacking the life. The soil on the left, that's soil from a forest immediately surrounding that tobacco field that was a farm up until about 120 years ago and then was abandoned and let go back to the forest. And nature rebuilt the soil, did it slowly, but it turned it into this sort of milk chocolate color. The difference between the khaki and the milk chocolate is carbon, soil organic matter, the remains of once living organisms. Um, that's the difference between fertility and, and land that you really need to chemically supplement to maintain high yields. If you add a whole lot of chemical fertilizers to really rich, fertile soil with a lot of organic matter, you don't get much in the way of a fertility boost. It's part of why 
fertilizers became popular in the 20th century is that we'd already degraded the fields of Europe and Eastern North America. So how, what have we done across North America in terms of, of uh, soil fertility and the organic matter in soils? The amount of carbon that was held in soils? This study from 2015 <coughs> basically argued that the soil organic matter, the SOM is soil organic matter content, of the agricultural soils across North America has dropped by 50%, by half, since the dawn of colonial agriculture. Now this illustrates that you know, part of the problem with soil degradation is the loss of the soil itself. Part of the problem is running the batteries down that drive the microbial processes that Anne will tell you about in more detail in a few minutes, but that really are the underpinnings of soil fertility. Because all that carbon in the soil, all that organic matter, is food for microbes. And they turn out to be an essential link in the cycling of nutrients that allow us to farm and farm sustainably. Now I also want to point out this is not simply a North American problem. How many of you had coffee this morning? All right, well this picture is from the heart of coffee country down in Costa Rica. It's from near the Continental Divide down there. And basically what it shows you on the left is the soil that you have in the jungle, in the native forest. It actually has, my notebook is sitting there sort of at the boundary between the topsoil and the subsoil. The subsoil is kind of reddish. Technically it's called an oxisol, the soil that you would have in this area. It's very oxidized and you can think of it as it's basically weathered and kind of rusty. The topsoil is, is black and rich and beautiful. You go into the coffee plantation on the same hillside further down where it's been um, a farm for about 100 years now conventionally. It's subsoil to the surface. There's no topsoil anymore, and they did it in just 100 years. The farmers growing coffee in the soils that have no longer have a subsoil have horrible blight problems, have Rio, um, <coughs> something called Rioja that is impacting their, 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 their crops. Healthy, fertile soil translates into resilience on parts of the plants. And again, we'll get to explaining how that works. But first, I want to get back to that question that I was asking. When I showed you that fence line and that extreme case of soil erosion, I was asking myself, how typical is that example? So I did something in terms of trying to figure that out. I went to the library and I vacuumed up all the data I could find about how fast are the world's soils eroding and how fast does nature build soils. And I literally found hundreds of papers, scientific papers out of the peer-reviewed literature that I gathered those data from and I compiled global averages. At the top, how fast is soil eroding from the world's farmland? Well, the global average is about, you know, and this is plowed farmland, conventionally tilled farmland. And the average rate's about a millimeter and a half a year. Now, a millimeter and a half a year, that's not a very fast rate, is it? It's kind of hard to watch something evolve over that. Your fingernails grow ten times faster than that. The San Andreas Fault moves ten times faster than that. And then, all, and then causes all kinds of problems when it does. Um, but that means that it would take less than 20 years to erode an inch of soil off of tilled farm fields, on average globally. Results on your farm or your yard may vary. But compare that to how fast nature makes soil. A pace of about 2% of a millimeter a year. That's even slower. That's really hard to figure out even how to measure. But it also means that it takes more than a thousand years for nature to make an inch of soil on average. The problem, of course, lies in the difference between those numbers. We've been eroding off the fertile skin of the earth, the soil that I'm sure Vandana Shiva will be talking more about later in the week. We've been eroding it off orders of magnitude faster than it replaces itself. We've been spending the natural capital that future generations will need to feed themselves. There's, sort of, there's no way, sort of way around that simple math. And in writing the dirt book, I wrestled with the idea of, well, what does this mean for the maintenance of agricultural societies over the long run? And I've kind of given you the, all the data that it would take to calculate for yourself the average longevity of an agricultural civilization. Because if we're eroding soils at about a millimeter a year or faster than they're being replaced, and that's conservative. I could have argued for a millimeter and a half. But let's just give me a millimeter a year in terms of an average loss of soil and you could erode off the typical hillside soil in most parts of the world in less than a thousand years. One of the things I realized in you know, researching the societies around the world that I wrote about in the dirt book was that that's approximately the lifespan of most agricultural civilizations. But there's some big exceptions that I hope you're sitting there thinking about. What about Egypt 
and the Nile. They've farmed it for thousands of years. What about the rivers of India, the Indus and the Brahmaputra that they've farmed for thousands of years? <laughs> what about the rivers of lowland China? The Tigris and the Euphrates? Those places where people have farmed using conventional tillage for thousands of years all occupy major river floodplains. What happens on a floodplain? It floods. And do floods bring clean water? No. Floods bring the soil from upstream. They bring the dirt from your neighbor's farm. They bring tires or whatever got into the river. <coughs> Most rivers naturally flood on average about once a year. And they don't flood very deeply. They just overtop their banks. But recall that one millimeter a year erosion rate off of the world's farmlands. How thick is a grain of sand? Well, it's about a millimeter. Two millimeters is coarse sand. One millimeter is medium sand. In other words, if you're farming on a floodplain and it's allowed to flood, nature will bring you new soil at about the, plate, the pace that you may be losing it from the plow. That's how societies farmed on major river floodplains for thousands of years. But when farming spread up onto the hillsides, that's when the clock started ticking on the ability to maintain farming practices on, soil, on landscapes where the soils eroded. That's sort of the, the guts of the dirt book. And I promise that the first part of the talk might be a bit depressing. We're through that part now. Because what I wanted to shift to is the question that I started asking myself, that I really wrestled with in writing the last chapter of that book, is soil restoration possible? Could we actually reverse the historical pattern of land degradation that limited the longevity of many societies around the world? And I'm not arguing that soil erosion killed off societies. What I'm arguing is that soil erosion undermined their vitality, their resilience. It helped contribute to their demise. Um, and the question, of course, is are we doomed to repeat that at a global scale, or do we have different options? Can we actually farm intensively in ways that will, will allow us to rebuild the health and fertility of our land and manage to feed ourselves at the same time? And I'm happy to say that I've become much more of an optimist. 